Boom, we're live. Ted Gillespie, welcome back to the Loose Head Sports Show, the number one sports show on planet Earth, proudly brought to you by Caffeine Chewing Gum Australia, probably the best caffeine supplement you'll ever have, ever. How are you, mate? I'd say so. Yeah. Oh, well, mate, it has to be. So many people keep asking me about, about caffeine gum, and Fuck. they just need to go and buy, fucking buy some. Just buy some. Well, thank you. www.caffeinegumaustralia.com. Strong, no discount yeah. policy. And uh, tell me if I'm wrong here, but at, le- at least half of the super teams are using it heavily at the moment. Are they not? Yeah, I dropped some. Uh, I've got AFL, NRL, so Tars buy it, Brumbies have bought it, not recently. Rebels buy it, um, Force buy it, uh, GWS bought some yesterday. Seagulls. Yeah, well, look, you know, we're if you want to be successful, get some caffeine in, in your gullet. Get it in now. <laughs> If you like seeing me do very little all day, every day, and going to the beach four times a day and drinking six to seven coffees a day, then please buy Caffeine Gum Australia. <laughs> while I do, while I just do rugby stuff all day. Yeah, good. Um, anyway, well, we had some rugby today, on the We did. We had a we trial had rugby. Game. We had rugby. Yeah, we did. What? Super Super Rugby. We had a trial game for Souths. Um, there was an A game. There was a Super W game. Um, there was a mate. There was a lot happening on the weekend. Wait, who did you play? We played the Tars Twenties, so we had like a mixed oh. sort of grade Colts team, and we we played the Tars Twenties, uh, which was a very good experience for some of the new boys and the young boys, and um, good to see where some of them are at. Um, then the A game was on, and I'm pretty sure Tars started well, but the Brumbies came back. The Brumby runners came back and and sort of put it on them in the second half, and then. Then this was all at, at uh, Foreshore Oval, otherwise known as Rob James, hmm. Rob James Park. Uh, then Super W was on it. it. Might have been the longest game in human history. Jed Gillespie. They played two. <laughs> 30, oh, it was an unbelievably long game. They played two thirty-minute halves, and then they played two fifteen-minute sort of halves as well. So they had the four breaks. So it just made it go real long. Uh, but mate, really enjoyed it. Some of the collisions that go in and the Super W puts the boys to shame, to be honest. All I was going to say is that the the collisions in Super W, massive, mate. Some of the girls are just putting in huge shots. Uh, I, I really enjoyed watching it. And uh, yeah, it's a great weekend, mate. What, what do you think of the Tars game? I'll, I'll come back to the Super W later because I actually watched their trial match the other week as well. Um, and I enjoy it. It's good. But they, I've got another topic for that one. Uh, the Tars game. Um, I gotta be honest. I think the Drua were awful. Um, wait, but at the simultaneously, I think the Tars were good. So it's not one of those games where the Tars could have done anything and still won. I think they probably could have won by sixty or seventy uh, if things went their way. Um, they 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 look good. They did some things well. Um, they you know they defended well. Um, they did the, they did enough to sort of to get over the line. I think it was a good start. Um, but the Drua for me are going to be bad. Yeah, I agree. I think they're going to struggle to win a game this year. And after watching the Tars game, I think they're going to win quite a few games this year. Um, do, do you know the the pleasing thing, and it's a good sign of any rugby team, is that I, I thought they did play well. And con- compared to last year, it was it's certainly an improvement on last year. But But I still think it wasn't a performance that they would be overly pleased with considering the opposition mm. and, and some of the errors and, you know, that some of the scrum stuff needs a bit of work on and, and there's some things that they can improve. But to to win a game and still not have, a, a, you know, an outstanding performance, let's just be honest, is a really good sign for the Tars, man. I, I think, you know, even the change in, within a year is quite remarkable, really. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's a good start. It's probably it's probably worked out well they play the duel first. It's just like we said with the trials, it's a good confidence builder, you know. Um, but on the duel side, like I think it's very good for Pacific Rugby that Moana and Fiji are in the, in the comp. But the question is now, if they get pummeled by 80 every game in both conferences and then by the other teams, is it still a positive? You know, I don't... I don't know whether maybe that this needed more of a build up, like two or three years. Because, like, by the way, they played their game plan was just bizarre. They they didn't do anything. They played like a almost Six Nations game plan where they went to their lineouts and their scrums, and none of it worked. Um, they didn't sort of rely on any of their natural flair, which they have because I watched the trials. So 
I just don't know whether it'll end up looking like a great thing if they both go through their conferences hammered. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because it's it's I I I remember I did a podcast with DC where I talked about this, and and he he's been one of the few coaches certainly that I know that's that's started a new franchise or a new team. And a lot of these teams have established cultures, established people, identities, and then they've got these two new teams who've come in and they're starting from scratch. I know the Moana Pacifica played a game or a couple of games over the last couple of years, but it's a brand new team, brand new people. And, you know, so they, they, they're they starting from way behind the eight ball because they've got to create this new culture, style of play and get everyone on the same page. And, and as you know, that doesn't happen overnight. So I think, you know, it's 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 a bit of short term pain for hopefully long term game. I, I just hope that the results aren't too bad. Oh fuck! See that lightning? Holy shit! Whew. Sorry, I'm like a dog with lightning, Jen. <laughs> fuck it, was hectic. Um, but yeah, yeah ho- been, hopefully the long term, hopefully about. the results now, the short term results don't cause them long term damage because I think once they event- eventually establish themselves and and start to, you know, come together for a lack of a better way of saying it. It's going to be exciting. Yeah. Look, look, the other thing is Moana didn't play, um, which so they've had a COVID issue, um, and it looks like it, they may or may not play this week again. So that's, I suppose, one of the other downsides where the Tars, like, you know, they could field. I know Tane Edmund backed up and did both games, but for the most part, if you said, mate, you have to field two games, they could field two games. Uh, like if Moana Pacifica or Drew need to field two games, they can't do it. Uh, what I think worries me a little bit is the I'm already looking ahead and maybe I shouldn't be to the back end of this Drew season and the back end of the Pacifica season. And I'm like, Pacifica might not play this week. Like they, they have a, another COVID because of an no, internal I, I COVID thing. I, I'm pretty sure I read something that said that they're already not playing this week. Yeah, so the first two weeks are out. Um, Partially just into Ardern's fault, partially just the nature of being there. They're effectively an isolated group of 30 guys stuck in another country. You know, mm-hmm. if we could, if we wipe 15 guys from the Tars, they would put out 15 more guys. Now, would they be good? No, not as near as good as the first 15. But as the season goes on, I worry about Moana already, and they haven't even kicked the fucking ball off. And I worry about the Drua in terms of talent, but also. If the trends follow from NRC, do you remember last year at NRC when the guy got done for biting? Yeah. <laughs> biting Andrew Reedy's fucking ear off and like stuff like on the weekend, there's going to be a plethora of suspension. A plethora. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. It's going to be interesting. I Look, the, some, Todd actually made an interesting comment to me is that uh, we've kind of had all of our Omicron sort of cases here and you, you are going to get a couple of interruptions from from time to time but but from what he was saying it seems like the peak of it's over whereas New Zealand haven't had that yet so whilst for some of them they haven't had a hugely interrupted pre-season or season it's coming so that they will lose guys uh, to the dreaded C word during the season and then perhaps perhaps when they eventually get over here um, the competition might live, be a little bit Closer, that's the hope anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think that, yeah, I know it makes sense. I mean, they've been the whole country's been locked down. Um, anyway, on, on to the next. I thought the Rebels Reds was a grind. My takeaway, my big takeaway from the game was there's, I don't know how the Rebels are going to score points, don't know how they're going to score tries. I, I don't see it, I don't see it happening through the set piece. Their back row was is a pure work. Workman back row. They've got a uh, Wallace guy down playing number eight, Wellesy and Brad Wilkin. Those guys all just work. Um, the back line wasn't particularly inspirational and isn't at a super rugby. I don't know how they score points. That's that's what my takeaway is. I think they kick a fuckload of penalties, um, but I don't think they had – their only guy, real game breaker, like line break bender was the reserve number eight who came on big unit and carried like an animal. So I yeah. just don't know how that team scores points at the moment. Um, someone someone pointed something out to me maybe last year is that um, one of the things the Reds do to get to get their attack into the game is obviously get Taniella Tupo getting go forward, and because they have him and he's very very good at getting them go forward, 
the rest of their attack kind of flows off him. Whereas a lot of the other teams do not have that type of character. And I don't think the Rebels, unless you get that number eight starting, which you probably will this week, going off going off that. Well, actually, no, he won't because the captain's the captain's a number eight. So he's going to be coming off the bench all year. So you, you really no, need Wells, to- Wells is at six. Wells is at six. Um, okay. But there, there's a young a young fella. Oh, I don't know if he's young. He's young to me. He, uh, Wallace at eight. So, right. look, yeah, I, they need they need like you said they need something to to change their demographic. Oh, look, they have a young five eight as well, um, Carter Gordon. I I thought, did you watch the game? I watched the first half. I didn't think he was very good. Um, I mean. I think you get some you get some leeway when you're young, like, and he's really young, like, you know, 21 or something like that. I think he had a game or two last year, and he and he might have done some good things. But at the end of the day, you can't you don't you don't get points for sort of just because you're young. So he wasn't overly great. He didn't control the game that well. Kicked a few balls out in the full. Um, they really, really, really need their guys back. They've got a few guys out, and they need them back because at the moment, um, I think they would probably be one up from the drawer down the bottom. What about the Brumbies game? Did you watch that game? Brumbies Force? Force are, force are a decent side. The Force are a decent side. It's going to be... I, I, yeah, they're going, to, they're going to trouble some people. I, I, I'd really like to see them play the Tars right now because I need to figure out whether... That would, for me, figure out how the sort of true power rankings are. Um, what were your thoughts on it? Yeah, um, the first half stats were something like 120 tackles to 19. So the force had all the ball. And then and then mm-hmm. apparently the Brumbies had something like seven line breaks that they failed to capitalize on. Um, I probably switched it off at about 55 minutes. It was just getting a bit grim, um, con- considering the amount of rugby I was on the weekend. Obviously, the scrum was good. I liked the Brumbies more, as always. Um They'll, they'll win a lot of games. I think they got some improvement there as well. But if you're if you're making 119 tackles, the Brumbies made in the first half, uh, and still winning the game, you know, it's not a bad result. Probably not the performance they would have liked though. No, I think I think the Force are capable of making some games ugly this year. I like that, and that's and like it was probably a bit of an ugly game. Um, making that sort of those tackles, like that percentage is. Very, very impressive to do. Um, but also the force, you know, at times they earn their possession. So, uh, look, I think the force, uh, it's really interesting where they sit. I think they'll, they're will they not thin necessarily squad-wise. Like, I think some like some of their second-string guys are effectively as good as their first-string guys. Yeah. Um, I think they're going to win some games. I think they're going to win some games. They seem to have recruited the opposite way to all the other Australian teams where they've, they've gone for a little bit of experience with their sort of second, third string guys, which, you know, if you think about it, it makes a lot it's of sense. It's so smart. It makes it's a lot so of sense. smart. And that's what I mean. Like, you know, if at the Tars where your first string guy, he's probably better. Oh, I'm not going to use it. Like, the, your Reds first string guy is probably better than the fourth first string guy. But the second and third string of the fourth, I think, are. Are very capable guys. They're they're my who. If I was putting a squad together, I'd have as sort of my squad players, guys yeah. who've done six years pro. You know, they're big enough for their position. Like, I think they're good at that. I don't know what happens over there to get them, but they're good at that. So, so I think the Williams force money. and the <laughs> yeah, I think the the coal money fresh off the the coal. Well, Twiggy, uh, mine, Twig, but, Twiggy yeah. owns Aaron Williams as well, so he's he's an absolute baller. You know, so what? Yeah. What? Why he would Greg Haynes want to play at forty-five years of age still? Yeah, I don't know why he wouldn't want to play at forty-nine years of age. But the yeah, look, I think the Tars and the Force for me are on a similar little plane in my mind. I'd like to see them play. What do you, um, you? What do you have? To, like going from the Tars game, what would be the improvements you'd like to see this week? They're Probably playing a proper set piece this week. Yeah. So they've had like set piece ascendancy for the last three games, including the trials um, and including the drawer who, you know, take away, there was penalties galore. And I think the ref personally just decided he was going to start penalizing the Tars. Um, I don't know. There was just the same collapse 45 fucking times. Um, but they're playing Taniella and whoever they choose to start at loose head, who, 
weren't very nice to the Rebels. And I don't think the Rebels have got that bad a scrum. Um, so that's going to be a challenge. Um, the other thing for the Tars, which sound like a fucking broken record, but I think if they have... Parecki has to play 80, I think, if they if they want to win tight games. Um, yeah. So he's, 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 I had to review the scrum. Yeah. I had to review the scrum for our level three course on the weekend. And and mm. the, the biggest change from when they took the first front row off to the second front row is, is um, what's the other hooker's name? Horton? Horton? Yeah, Horton's, Horton's scrummaging at an angle. And then because he's doing that, Tetra's at an angle and all the weight of the scrum was going on to, to young Tiar. Um, but with when you've got Dave Parecki there, the scrum's better. The line out's going to be better. Um, around the field, it's going to be better. So it's, it's a hard one because I think you got to blood these guys. Like the Tars were obviously going to win that game. So that's the time where you got to put those young guys on, give them a taste of super rugby rather than when you're playing the Reds and it's, you know, 10 minutes to go and you're still fucking in the game. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, well, yeah, it makes sense. But look, I think. So you got to balance, be you gotta the balance tar- progressing these guys. You got to, sorry, you got to balance progressing these guys with winning games because there's a point in the season where they will need them. Absolutely. I mean, but like, yeah, at the moment, I don't think the Tars can treat their bench as finishes. This term, this like All Blacks thing where these yeah. seven guys come on who are all awesome as well and they're good for that time in the game because that's not where they are at the moment. So like the Reds playing Tani Yellow for 80 when they've got fucking hard games, I think a lot of these guys have got to play massive, massive minutes in order for the Tars to win tight games. Um, I, I think this will be their first test of actually playing a football team that... Um, Plays conventionally, but a good of the conventional thing. So, like, the, the Reds have a good line They have a very, very good scrum. They have a kicking 10. They've got all the things, you know, that the Druid didn't have, to be honest. So, it's going to be a test. I just don't – they've gone well in their trial matches and Drua having a good scrum and line out for the first – for the most part. Yeah. If that stuff is taken away, I'll just be interested because they don't really have a conventional fullback. You know, they – yeah. I agree. I agree. So um, I actually put on Instagram for a few fan questions, and and one of them was, after round one, have you revised your power rankings? I think the I think the Brumbies would have to be one. I, the Reds have been a bit shaky, so yes, I've revised them. Uh, I still think the Reds will win the comp, but I'll have Brumbies one. Uh, I win the Australian version of the comp and. Yeah, like they'll be the top of the Australians. The yeah, the top of the Australians. Yeah. Was there anything that's a, this is a two part question from from um, you know listener? Um, were there any any surprises from round one for you? Um, wait, just quickly, it'll be so it's now Brumbies Reds. Uh, I'm gonna have Tars up to three. Yeah, Force Rebels Drua. So yes, being changes galore. Um, yep. But the Rebels are in big trouble unless they get their guys back. I'd agree with that. I, I reckon when it gets down to late in the year, Rebels, Tars uh, will be a very interesting game because there'll be a lot of shoot shield guys, hopefully a lot of Eastwood guys playing. Uh, were there any any surprises um, from, from that round for you? Yeah, I, I thought – I thought we, I, 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 again, I've, I've mentioned it. I thought we'd see a little bit – a different game plan from the draw. I thought they were going to light it up, score some tries from 70, 80 – they beat the force on the bell in the trials, 100 meter try, you know. So their whole game plan was um, was a surprise to me. I thought we'd see some more points as well from the Reds. Um, I just thought like they've got a they're an electricity factor in terms of like you know, Pattaya, O'Connor, the back row at plus one who are all amazing. Yeah, um, Harry, Harry so Wilson. I, I thought I'd, we'd. Harry Wilson. Like, I thought we'd see some more points. So I, I was a little bit surprised that that game also wasn't, um, you know, up in the sort of 30s, 30 to 15 or something like that. But there, there got, wasn't any major shocks. Have you got a player of the round? Oh, Jake Gordon was pretty good, man. Do, do you know who stood out for me on the weekend? And I, I don't like talking him up, but I, I thought Holloway was outstanding. Yeah, old, man Hol- old man Holloway, um, you know he's finally he's finally playing footy. Like, you know, yeah, I know. He, he, look, he's a good player, man. He, he's he's a very good player. So, 
Uh, it's good to see him get some flowers. If he if he grinds this out, I think he'll beat some people up and surprise some people. We should start a publicity campaign to get him in the Wallabies, but I don't think that would actually help him uh, if we no, did that. It would hurt him a lot. <laughs> it definitely would. Um, all right. Did you have anything else you want to talk about before we go to some fan questions? Anything interesting? Yeah, I do. I, I do. So quickly. Go. So the Tars, Tars are playing the Reds. Um, uh, Tars are 375. I think that's probably a bit long. Um, they're they're That'll be closer than people think. Unless the Reds unlock something that they haven't unlocked yet, that'll be closer than people think. Brumbies, Fiji, uh, that could be Brumbies, 100. Brumbies will kill them. That could be 100, and I think the Force are going to beat Rebels. That will, be just, either, had, that will either be a great game or a terrible game uh, to watch, and uh, I'm with you on that. I agree with you on all three. I think the Reds will beat the Waratahs, though. I hope I'm wrong. Yep. Um, yeah, going, I've got one. I've got, I've got one thing to raise. Go one thing, and it ties back to Super W. Did you see the um, thing going around Instagram about women's uh, women's sport and their pay discrepancy? Yes, but y- yes, I did. Yes, yeah. I just it was interesting. I was having I was discussing it with a few people. We've tried to solve that issue here before, but um, it was interesting to see actually what the pay what the payments were. Um, yeah, particularly in the W. Uh, I don't think it's called W anymore. Netball was was interesting. I thought the WAFL, AFLW, or like whichever way they they're branding it this year was interesting. But it came back to the shared like, it. I'll say I've seen it on a few pages. Can you remember anyone on the chat? I'll, I'll see if I can. Uh, two seconds. Uh, I found it interesting. Well, there's two ways to look at it, right? If you look at it from a purely like revenue model, the payment isn't going to be good. Yeah, here it is. So minimum wages of women in sport. I'm just going to send it to you. Uh, AFLW, 16,000. WNBL, 15. WBBL, 26. That's not a long tournament. Uh, A-League, 16 grand. Super Nepal, 43. Super W, unpaid. NRLW, 8,500. Um. And then that compared to the the guys who were ver- very low, <laughs> I thought. Um, lower, certainly lower than you'd expect, particularly with the AFL. Um, I kind of expected the rest, but that's the minimum. So potentially people are getting a lot more than that. You know, yeah. It's, it's, I it's suppose the, that, yeah, well, like, there's two ways. There's two ways to go about it. Like you can yeah. pump money into it. So like I, the argument is always. At the moment, like those, the the reason hypothetically why people get paid, and it's like you take the argument to tennis, is why women's tennis get paid is because they attract massive crowds. The women's tennis is on par with men's in terms of people want to go to watch those games. They get paid the same. Um, at the moment, that's not the case. So, you know, whilst me and you and most of our friends are, spend half of the year sitting around in a bar like discussing hypothetical arrangements of players that will never happen because you weren't crazy people. Um, that's not the case at the moment for women's sport. So it's subsidised, I would say, enormously by, by the other side. But the argument is, well, why don't you boost one up, like boost something up, boost AFLW up and see if you can get, get traction because it's very hard to get traction from the bottom. Um and I don't really have an issue with that. I think it's worth a test case in certainly one of the one of the sports. But a core part of it is at some point, like if you, you know, if you if you want equal pay and you want this and you want men, women's athletes to earn more, you have to go and watch. You have to buy merchandise. Yeah. You have to support the team. You have to do all that shit because, like, in the same way that like. 12 of my mates are all nerds are sitting around at 4 a.m. doing fantasy football. Like, that has to carry over a little bit. And that's the, like, that's the way that, you know, wages will go up. I completely agree. My, my argument would be, so that a lot of people would make the, the argument about that, but my argument would be that um, if the marketing revenue was relatively equal, then maybe uh, they'd have a chance of boosting the profile for the sport. That would be my counter-argument to that. Um, but I yeah, no, no, no. I'm, 
I agree. I'm, I'm with you on that. So, like, I'm saying, like, let's boot. Like, I think one of the sports should boost the marketing profile. Like, get it out there, get it happening. Um, like, uh, me and you are probably some people who'd watch it. But like, if you're a proponent of female sport and you're a big fan of female sports, they need females who are as crazy and interested as as we are in it to constantly watch it and support it. Yeah. Um, so I'd happily see that as a test case, but otherwise. The thing that was resounding from that for me is the fact that the men's salaries are also awful. So, that's you know, the, in again, sports where again, that's the, that's the minimum. That is the minimum. Yeah, I know, I know. But like, how many? We, I know a lot of fucking people on the minimum. Yeah, or not, not the well, minimum, but like not far off. I would have thought Super Rugby would be less than that, actually. Fifty-three. So it says here fifty-three thousand Super Rugby minimum. Um, There'd be people getting oh, paid like, less than that. If, yeah. I mean, if you look at like, but if you look at, say, the revenue of interest as defined by gender at the moment, and it was so, it, realistically, it's probably 95% male, mm. you know, the pay discrepancy is then not that big. But I I would, I watch all of, I don't watch the WNBL, but apart from that, I watch pretty much the rest of it. So I'd like to see wages increase. Like Super W being unpaid sucks um effectively makes it a club comp and it's be very hard to do if you're a professional woman like, some serious with commitments job with some serious commitments involved yeah. as well you know it's like yeah it's it's, it's amateur but they're, they're taking it very seriously so I suppose, they should definitely yeah i mean i agree but the, the thing that annoys me is all the pages that share it right i know i know the players one eight i guarantee you all these people don't so, like, if they just gave a more of a fucking actually, you know, there's like 30,000 followers on this page. If they all went and bought a membership or followed the team and went to the games, those the, the women would have a salary. The problem is, I like, I'm the one who knows who their outside center is. Like, you're the one who watched the game on the weekend. So, it's people need to do a little bit less virtue signaling, a little bit more actually fucking pouring time into the team. Yeah, but look, be very interesting if they came up with like a Super W streaming service and they charge a subscription fee to watch the games uh, and all that revenue, once you cover costs, goes back into the, the player pool. It'd be very interesting to see what they came up with there. I fucking 100% support that and agree with that. I love the NRLW. Um, I like the Super W, but people need to start getting on board because otherwise... We're, like there's no there's no point complaining. We need people on board. Right on, now, get some more conversations. Spraying me. A little more action. Action. There's some I can't. There's some I can't ask. These uh, are Eastwood guys like giving me a tip. By the way, I love that about them. Um, would you rather get dicked in a scrum or get manhandled by a nine while carrying? That's from Mister Jake Douglas. I, reckon, I mean, both of those things have definitely happened to me. So I'd probably rather get smashed. Oh, gee. I'd probably rather <laughs> I'd probably rather get smashed in a scrum. Oh, it was, okay. Well, let's let's uh let's put that to push over try or get smashed by a nine. Smashed by a nine. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? I'd rather get fucking smashed by a nine. I'd be like, man, then. Yeah, that nine's good. I, De- I remember the first time I met Devet Roos. I'd like run at him in training. Didn't realize that he was like a South African junior wrestling champion and just sat me on my ass. I'm like, oh, I'll never, never made that mistake again. Um, what human would complete? Yeah, exactly. Pain, I mean, there's some the Jack duo- Noirs. Apologies, sir. I've cut you off. It's a very bad habit of mine. All I was going to say is uh, what human would complete your wolf pack and make this duo a throuble? If we were going to add a third host to this show, um, two seconds. It says my internet isn't working. This is just, we need to do these in person. You're yeah, buddy. Is it the rain? It's kind of backed off here. Good. Yep. Go ahead. Um, thru- oh, far out. 
uh, not enough people know the person, but Dave Portnoy would be my number one. I love Dave Portnoy. I what want about to be people that, now. Oh, I, I love um, him too. Look, a bit of a yeah, hero to both of us. But uh, if we could actually get someone that was a possibility, <laughs> who would that be? Saying Dave's done available. Um, who did he ask? 25 podcasts. What's one more for him? You know, From the sporting world, I'd love – to get Peter Fitzsimmons on here and just hammer him about being a communist. Um, Would you actually hammer him? I reckon I could actually get him. Yeah, but like what? As a regular guest or one on? Oh, not a regular. Well, maybe not. Not a regular guest, but he wanted. To, he'd definitely do it. I reckon he'll want to talk rugby, and I'll just start asking him about his economic policies. Uh, oh, Chubby, I don't have a good answer for this. Have you got someone you go to straight up? No, look, obviously, if like for the views, it'd be good to get Michael Hooper on every week or Nick, Nick yeah. Honey Badger Cummins. He'd be awesome, you know. Yeah, I wouldn't mind knowing. I want to know what went on backstage of The Bachelor, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> but I don't, that's a ball of movement. Yeah, I don't, I don't, on, by the way. I love that from him. Yeah. Well, I don't. I, there's one jumping out of me from the media that I'm like, oh, I, I desperately need Waleed Ali on here to fucking drown out my, drown out my rant. Fuck that. Yeah, there's guy, a bro. strong no Waleed Ali policy on this show, mate. Strong no oh, Waleed Ali policy. Man. Hate that. Guy, bro. What's next? What would your porn star name be? To to go to something serious all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> You go first, bro. Fuck this segment. This is bullshit. You go first. I'm fucking sick of this. What the, well, like of the re, of the remaining questions, that's like the only one that I could ask. <laughs> You're kidding. There's some, oh, there's some terrible ones. Like, have you got any tips for a young bloke looking for love? That's that's another one. I had to cut the first half of that out though, because because you probably don't. Yeah, really okay. Want I I got some tips. I got I got tips for that. I got tips for that. I, my advice would be play statistics, date, weight, far better looking people than you, and then as soon as you find one, try and have a baby as fast as you can. Lock her in. <laughs> so, so she can't leave you. Yep. That's um, that, um, that would be my... That, that's, that's <laughs> I was going to say, do it once you've had a sporting career because, uh, you know, that shit gets complicated, son. All right, anything else, Mr. Jack Gillespie? Oh, 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 actually, I wanted to ask you. you you're obviously a big Justin Trudeau fan. Um, what do you make no, of what's going no on in offense. Canada at the moment? That's not what you were saying offline. Canada, Canada oh. is effectively being run by a tyrant at the moment. It's very, very bad. Very bad. Um, he, he tried to bring in some crazy laws as well. We spoke about them last week, emergency powers. They got shut down by the federal court. So um, really interesting, though, that Go, GoFundMe, they raised $10 million and GoFundMe said, no, we're not going to give it to them. So they're all vaccinated as well. Like the vast, vast majority of them vaccinated. But it's very, it's, it's a, such a weird political time. It really is. Um, yeah. Canada's yeah. bad. Canada, because China, China, Canada at the moment for me, Ooh, Canada was man, Canada was always the place, wasn't it? It was like the fucking the place to go. But now, yeah, from all the stuff you're hearing now, it's like you wouldn't go near there. Yeah, we've always been really similar to, to Canada, like very liberal, like you know, like very welcoming with our thoughts. But they've, I don't know, for the first time ever, I've been actually asked to like put under some pressure with something, and they've. Not handling it very well, unfortunately. So I sat on a plane um, once to Hong Kong, and uh, it was China Air, and there were two non-Chinese people on the plane. There were two blokes that weighed over 115 kilos on the plane, and they sat us both right next to each other. And uh, he's a guy from Whistler in Canada, and geez, that sounds like a place, Jed Gillespie. People like you would really enjoy it. Yeah, man. I imagine. I've heard. I'm. I'm not a snow sport. I like snowboarding, but I'm not like a guy who went and did like seasons out there. I've heard unbelievable things about Whistler. Effectively, it's the, you know, where I lived in America equivalent. It's just, it's just heaven on earth. So <laughs> he called it never, um, never land. So you go there and never grow up. And he was telling well, me stories about how he'd go like cross country skiing, but he'd have to take a knife and a gun just in case they came across like a grizzly or a wolf or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Or just a, an angry sports fan. Um, 
I, I would I would love to live in uh, just uh, besides the current environment with uh, uh, Commander Trudeau. I would love to be in Canada. I've heard nothing but good things. Um, they love rugby as well, uh, big mar- which big is good. marijuana country as well. <laughs> which is good for you. I'm not. I don't like marijuana. Um, I tell you. Oh, actually, I tell you what annoyed me this week, Chubby. Do you follow like rugby pass and all those things on Instagram? Yeah, but. I need to see oh, what they're they, doing. The highlights they put up of the MLR are the worst fucking highlights of all the, the most American things, bro. They're like the reason why we love rugby. It's just like one guy passing it to another guy. Like when you get into, into highlight stuff, I'm expecting fucking high level things. There was one the other day saying, like, you know, best is this the best palm of all time? Guy palms and gets tackled. I'm like, you guys are so fucking American. Um, I, they, there's a chance they'll turn it into a different sport over there. Uh, the MLR is, um, I actually think DC got in and out at a fucking great time because the. Well, I think it would be a really fun place to go to play football, but Americans just have a strange way of Americanizing everything about the contacts and the rules. They, they nonstop talk about the rules of the game. It fucking drives me crazy. I want to ask you a question. Do you do, you do your review for a game straight after a game? So, like, you played at three finish at five and then you'll do your review that night or do you wait till the next day? I'll probably do it that night or at least half. Interesting. I saw the Tars boys all did it the night after that night, straight after they finished. Going, yeah. I, like, I, I do none it. of you would have slept. They wouldn't have slept and gone straight to a coaching thing the next day. Yeah. It's, it oh. fucking sucks. Like A little um, bit different at Shoot Shield because you're finishing at five. Like, even if you stay for a couple of beers, you could be home by seven. So you could do it then. But if you're finishing a super rugby game, you finish at 10.30, an hour pre-match stuff, post-match stuff, then you're getting home by midnight, realistically at the absolute earliest. Yeah, no, it's not It's not easy. But, I, like, I, yeah, it's, it's, I'd say it's a lot easier to shoot. You'll just suck down a few Diet Coke real quick after the game, run home, um, and then, yeah, just get straight into it. I'd say, like... Last year, I'd usually wrap around like twelve thirty or one, but yeah. the super guys, like they, like I suppose it is their job, but at the same time, Saturdays would be particularly fucking exhausting, getting the team off the bus at on the bus at you know ten a.m. or whatever wherever they are, and then you know pulling up stumps on reviewing the I drew a spear tackle from a fucking ruck at you know four a.m. So. It'd be a bit. Then the, they're at Southern Districts Rugby Club at nine nine the next morning. Yeah, actually, I uh, I spoke to young uh, Tane Edmund. Um, he played both games, he did. which I thought was very old school. Very old school. It was a throwback. Um, so he would have no doubt. Which I really tickled me because I I I don't know. I think he's a big fan of the show, but I think he's a inconsistent fan of the show. So. Made me laugh that he had to go and do that. Um, he probably thought he was done for the weekend, and then he's in the car on the way to fucking. He would have got, got, <laughs> not... got a message at three a.m. going, "Hey, Tane, you, you need to play this weekend. Uh, play tomorrow." And he, he would have been, where, "Where do all you people go over from West Ryan? There'd be some bowl. Not only, <laughs> <laughs> not only play though. Like you got to start. You got to start at ten in this game. Oh my goodness me! So. Actually, that reminds me. In I know in Ireland, so like the shoot shield equivalent in Ireland, the AIL, um, second grade play on Sunday. So only first grade play Saturday. So if you're on the bench for once, which we've both been on the bench for once a few times, there's no drinking Saturday night. You've got to be on the bench on Saturday. You might get 20 minutes and then all your mates go out in Dublin, fight people, Kiss Irish girls, and you just got to be what having a tea or hey, being really pissed. Why do they do that? Just to I have no, no fucking idea. I had uh, Tom Murphy, who's our seven at Eastwood. He played in it. Another friend of mine played over there. Um, and yeah, it's, you just don't want to be in second grade. I, I mean, if there's ever incentive to train hard, work hard, it is Maybe to that's why. play your Maybe game on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, it's like I, That's I reckon it, the hardest Actually, job in shoot shield yeah. is being a third grader and then having to sit in the bench for second grade. Like the lower grade guys that have to sit, and then all of a sudden there's an injury in the first five minutes, and they have to play two full games, and then sometimes they might have to sit stand by for first grade as well. 
I've had to do that a few times. Yeah, mate, I, I, absolutely, guys, I've had to do that. I think certainly from it's happened a few notable times at Eastwood, like you know, very very obvious where someone goes down the first thirty seconds or something like that, and I think the guys have made a habit of like giving them their match payment because like fuck me imagine playing like 80 second grade like you get very cold after that game you're probably buzzing or you're sad from whatever you wouldn't, happened. Have been, you wouldn't have been eating since like very early that morning you know dehydrated fucking yeah. hard, man. it's a it's actually a skill i actually i really liked playing off the bench i because i fucking hate warming up um so i liked playing off the bench but you know a lot of guys like to be nice and warm and like you know, do everything. You're free. I don't care what you do on the sideline during the shoot shield. You are fucking freezing when you get on that field and everyone's pissing, sweat, gassed. Um, it's, it takes a while to get in the game. It's hard. It's really hard. You going to play this year? No, 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 no. I I'm actually, we did that. When you play, I'll clip this. Yeah, you can clip it whenever you like. I'll fucking, <laughs> you can have the keys to my car if I play. I, um, but you don't want to shit car. I, <laughs> I we did bow model on Saturday as a bit of a get out there, see the world. Uh, so I went and I had to take shoes for someone. I obviously forgot to do that, so I gave them my shoes. I uh, thought I can just sort of stand halfway up hill. And uh, have you ever done it? Nah, never been. Uh, it's a, it's a basically go from the beach of bow moral. All the way up to the road, probably like six, seven hundred, six hundred meters, and it's yeah. inclined. Um, but after sort of half a rep, I was like, I can't stand here and watch the boy. Like, I need to do it. If they're going to yeah. have any respect for me. So I did about three barefoot, and I fucking could not fucking walk the next day. Couldn't walk. I, I still got massive, massive calf problems. I'd have 20 calves, but big problems with them. Um, and it just made me think, I don't ever want to train this hard ever again. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Once you've lost it, you've totally lost it, eh? Like, I was half tempted to play third grade maybe this year or fourth grade. Right. Just for, like, an excuse to exercise because I've been so lazy lately. And then um, I started going to training, like, obviously coaching. I'm like, there's no way I'm doing this, man. No way in hell. It's too hard. No. Yeah, I think I used to always think the same thing, walking. Like, you know, when you're getting ready to go – uh, like get strapped for the game or whatever the fuck, walking across watching second grade, I used to look at the contacts and go, oh, I was the same. Hell. Third grade, the same. I was <laughs> that and going, looked awful. There's no way what? I want to do that. And then you play first grade and it's like another step up as well. Um, actually, yeah. you know, it was very interesting seeing the 20s game and then the A game straight after. Just be huge. The huge jump in standard. Very yeah. noticeable when you see it one after the other. Oh, mate. Um, so different. Like I, my first year of Colts, I played grade first and then I went back to Colt and the speed, it doesn't sound right because Colt guys should be so fast. The speed of men's games is so fucking fast. Like if you're coming from Colt, even up the grades, like, that's one thing you notice. Obviously skill level changes, but the fucking speed of first grade versus first Colt, it's like watching it on times two. It's just so fast. Um, and that's what, yeah. When's your first trial game? Twelfth, I think. Okay, so coming up pretty quick. Does that make sense? Yeah, twelve. Yeah, yeah, so we um twenty six we this week, we, so two weeks after. We split out well, like our first trial. We sort of, we have two sort of intermingled teams rather than a first grade, second grade. Yeah. Um, we've been doing that for sort of three years, I think. So yeah, we'll, we'll have that for the first trial, and then I think they'll start. Uh, like you know, picking the side after that. Who um who are you playing? I believe we're playing Gordon straight off the bat. Um, okay. It's funny with trials. Do, do you guys have like you? Do you guys have teams you play every fucking year? Yeah, we seem to. Yeah. I think we've changed it a little bit this year. I, I don't. Yeah, I I try and stay out of that. We always used to go to Rockdale, which is the worst place. Shout out to Rockdale. Worst place in the world to go. Um, there's an El Janar <laughs> Cogra now, so that makes it a little bit more bearable to go there. Uh, El Janar, big fan of the show. We will take free food for sponsorship if you want to sponsor us, El Janar. But yeah, usually the same teams every year, but I think they're mixing it up this year. We're playing trials at South as well. 
Yeah, from what I gather, the trials, and I this is based on some very loose, like me observing, but the trial situation is very much like, hey, Chubby, do you go on a play game? And then you're like, yeah, we, all right. I don't know why we didn't ask and you. We just tee it up. Well, wait, but like, think back, back like a decade. I, I can only remember playing sort of max five teams in the whole decade. We always play Sydney Uni. We always play Gordon. And we play Wes a lot. And like that's we we that's mostly our three trials. I don't know who do you guys got? Uh, we've got Gordon and East. Ah, th- uh, Warringah. Gordon and Warringah. We've got a trial in Barrel versus Queenbin and the Illawarras. Well, Illawarriors in a couple of weeks, and then Gordon and Warringah. Awesome. So yeah, so it's awesome. a nice. I love change-up. Barrel. I love Barrel. I never been. I never shout been out to time. Barrel. Shout out to mate. Great. It's fucking great. And the the Barrel Blacks. Um, Home home ground is where they had the last trial the other week. It's great. It's fucking I, great. So I had this thought. I had this thought the other day, and I'm not saying we could do it or should do it. Would you ever? Do you, do you ever reckon you could do a live training session with another club? I'm sure I've asked you before. Oh, like a scrimmage. Yeah. So just say like Eastwood and South. We're going to do a forward session, and we're going to do. 15 live scrums, 20 live scrums, whatever it is, and then we'll do like a, a block of mauling and a block of lineouts. Like, do you reckon that that would work? Or would it just get up some shit because guys would get competitive? Because I know England England sometimes do it with Georgia, um, which would be fucking pretty rough with the scrum. Horrible. But yeah, but, but Horrible. And it might maybe if you're doing it against a team that you don't play against, maybe that's how you do it. I don't know. But Well, they do it in the NFL. You see it on like... Yeah. Stuff they do like you know the Cardinals and Seahawks would do like a scrimmage where they, there's no contact, but you know the attack and defenders are running their routes. Um, yeah. So I don't know, man. I've never fucking I've never thought of that in my life. Mm, never. I had that thought the other day because we were, we were scheduled to do a session with Waratah forwards, and I'm like, fuck, I imagine. I wonder if other teams would want to do it because you want to put your guys in game situations. There's no better mm. way to do it. You know, then you probably get people like James Whalen just going full crazy. I had to bring him up. Shout out to Wailo. <laughs> Shout out to Wailo. No, he, I think he'd be fine. Um, yeah, I, I think that'd be interesting. I think I could see, like, I could see coaches being interested in that. I could say, I don't know what that doesn't happen at the moment. I mean, you're not going to do it with Sydney Uni because so they're going to fucking want to punch their heads in. But, yeah. And shout out to Sydney Uni. I'm just talking about my players, especially not the guys who wear the gold jackets in the fucking crowd. Um, but, uh, like with two teams who are fairly amicable and like at the right point in prison, I think that would be quite useful. Yeah. The, the only thing I would think is, is if we're doing it against you guys, we wouldn't sh- want to show any of our lineouts. We wouldn't want to show our mall system. Well, that that's the, you know, right? that's, so that's the downside re- to it. it. Yeah. Yeah. See, it reduces it where like I'd, I'd be like, right, guys, you can only do, you know, this first, 15% of lineouts. You can't do anything after that because it doesn't matter what happens today. Really what you get the most out of is scrummaging. So really yeah. we're, we're taking these back now and we're effectively, we're, we're taking our scrums on the road, basically. That's the theory. Yeah. No, no it's interesting because you get guys that like the same guy scrum against each other every week. And, and yeah, some, yeah. People, some people do different things. So trying to give them more game-specific sort of looks, I guess, if you will. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's... It, in essence, uh, the, the that's why, like, if you do in any position, you have a guy who's fucking played a billion games, man. He's already. That's why they're so valuable now in the under twenty five comp. Is because like he doesn't have to do this travel. You know what I mean? Like he's already played that guy. He's played that guy. He's played that guy. I heard a thing when I was young that Ben Robertson used to write down all the tight heads he played and what they what they did. Yeah, and I don't know if that's actually true, but. That's effectively what you get with your experienced guys. You, you just you sort of know how to play. I remember playing, thinking guys packing certain ways, what to do on certain days, and I think you'd get that in any position. I know uh, guys have played rugby for Australia who'd have a database of all the props in, in that competition that they might come against. So just say one week I'm playing against Reece Sheriff, and then I'm, and you know Eastwood might have a Jed Gillespie type character as well. So I've got he'd have a database of everyone that he would play against, so he could go and look at your scrums, write down everything that he knew about you, so that he could just go back and look at it. So he would do that every preseason. Crazy. Yeah, I mean, 
we like I remember in Melbourne, like I we, when we played the Tars, they were like, "Yeah, can you pack in a certain way this week?" Like, or like you know, trying to what replicate. What do you think of that, the by the way? What do you think of that? Because I, I guess if you're preparing a guy to play Super Rugby, that that's fine. So you could angle in or hit square or do whatever the loose heads are doing. That's fine because you're not playing. But if you're getting your second grade guys to do that against your first grade guys, in a way, you're sort of messing up your second grade guy. Oh, it's very, it's very difficult. I mean, that the having that those guys, I think, is so good for Super Rugby. Like having having ten extra guys who like, and this is fucking what happens every week. You get a sheet with a lineouts on it, and what out the you know that your coach perceives their lineouts to be. You fucking learn them. You you figure out how they scrum. I mean, you know, they change so much, but you scrum like that. You get their attack, and you learn it all every week. So for people who don't know that, like that's what you do. So if you're sort of didn't get picked for the Rebels 23 and you're in the next 10, that's what you're doing that week. So this week, they are the they are the force. And so they've learned all the force lance, all the force scrums. They've got their force attack. There'll be someone in a red bib, you know, and he's fucking uh, region Pasatoa uh, or Bailey. Um, and he's got to be them for the training session. I think it's so helpful, like, I think it would be really helpful, like from a defensive perspective, having guys just doing a similar attacking style, similar attacking style at training. But at shoot shield level, I don't know. It's not. It's not possible. Because to me, unless you're I, willing I agree. to, so, yeah, it's like the scout team in the NFL. They have these yeah. guys that do do that. But in, at shoot shield level or second grade level, if I'm going to get my loose head to angle in, some of them are going to think, "Oh, hey, Chubby wants me to angle in in the game." Yeah, do, do you know? Do you know what I mean? Or, Definitely or know game. what you mean. So it's a it's a it's, hard one because you want so, to give your um, first grade guys looks, but you got to take off look after your other guys as well. Yeah, it's so, but it's so it's I, I look I spent no no secrets I spent fucking thirty five weeks on scout team pretty much, um, and it's, it's it's very fucking useful. Like you do see if you if you have a good coach, you'll see the same things that you have to learn replicate in the games. Um, and I could I can already see it as being such a useful tool for training. It's just me having ten fucking guys who I could be like okay you know, run an 11 pattern and then kick the corner and just do all the things that um, that the team you're playing do, but you can't do it at, um, at shoot shield because you're just knifing 10 blokes who are probably next up to bat. Yeah. Um, just on shoot shield quickly, Chubby, before we close it out, there's, there was like some rumors the other year. I don't know whether they're sticking around, but like I suppose that the, the two contrary points for the shoot shield were four grades, three colts, right? Correct. The other, I believe, was two and two. Well, the other, the alternative proposal, do you mean? Yeah. And so I know that, like, there was some sort of pack, like mega, mega power pack forming between the, effectively, the more wealthy clubs, um, to which I'm not including our own because we don't actually have money. But, like, you know, East, Sydney Uni, something like that. And they wanted to make it more of a elite comp in the respect of having, you know, two really good grades you folks on and then two Colts. Yeah. Like, what, there, what would be, like, so I mean, I suppose the question would be like, <laughs> the, <laughs> had you heard that before? Yeah, yeah, I have heard that, yeah. What yeah. are your thoughts on uh, it? I think... There's a huge amount of self-interest going on with a lot of people. And I think in an ideal world, four grades, three cults is awesome. More people playing rugby, more people through the doors. Uh, you want – it's a community club. So the beautiful thing about Shoot Shield is that it's always been a home for aspirational players and for the guys who just want to have a beer with their mates on the weekend. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's been very special for the entire time. I, I think the world's changed a little bit and there's like even talking to some kids coaches, there's far less kids playing sport these days than ever before. And and I think you have to do a lot of recruiting. So we've talked about this before, but there are, there are clubs who have done a huge amount of recruiting. So they've got four grades, three colds. And, and I think if your motive, Jed, is to improve the standard of rugby, Having a premier grade team and a second grade team and a top Colts team, maybe a second Colts team, is probably going to be the way to go because once you get a few injuries, 
you're going to dilute the standard of the remaining competitions towards the back end of the year. So I, I don't know. I'm, it's going to be very interesting, but I, I think it depends on their motives. If they want as many people playing rugby as possible, I think you've got to have your four grades, your three colds. If you are looking to improve the standard of rugby, I, I think that's going to be, make it very hard if you have all those grades. Yeah, man, I, I, I sort of your first take, I couldn't have said it better. I, I didn't like it at all. Um, they're like the best, the best. I mean, I'll say not all clubs have massive culture and that's not coming from like some sort of fucking high horse where I think we're the center, center of culture in the world. I think we need to be way better actually. But like South has a fucking huge culture that comes with the club. And a lot of that is generated in threes and fours. Because they're yeah. guys who are playing purely because they like playing football. There's no like fucking payments. There's no interest to go to England. There's no super rugby. They're like playing footy on the weekend. So I, I it just it came back to my mind just because you know if you don't we we haven't seen I've missed some regulars at training who are sort of always a fourth grade regulars, but you underestimate how important they are to the club because they drive a lot of the culture, the internal culture. I think I went to a two team one Colts club, um, it's more professional. Um, you'd have squads, otherwise we wouldn't play. You, I think you're you right. Could still do that, might go Jed, up. I think you could still do that and have your third and fourth grade guys. So rather than make it a compulsory thing, you go, we're still going to have third and fourth grade, but the requirements for the club to be in this competition, you're going to have first and second grade. And then when Eastwood has a good third grade or fourth grade team, you're still playing a competition. So I think you could have the best of both worlds there. Um, but look, as you know, mate, there's nothing better when you're a first grade guy and you walk in the gates and fourth grade have won your first game of the day. Just sets the tone for the day. Uh, we, we had like yeah. an old boy kind of reunion day on the weekend. Uh, they did like some, something we've tried to do is because there's been a huge generational change and a lot of new guys to the club and then you throw in the C word over the last couple of years. They kind of lost connection with some of the old boys. So we had a little bit of a day where some of the boys got to hear some of the stories of fucking crazy people like Rob James. And uh, it was awesome, mate. It was awesome. You know, yeah. You're right. I think They're that, the guys that create the culture that's a point, the club. That's a very good point about COVID because I, I too think that it's eroded some people turning up who would have turned up otherwise just, just because, like, they got used to not turning up. Um, yeah. And it's also – it's it's been fucking t- too – effectively two years since we've had a comp. Um, so I think it has like detached a little bit. So and that was a smart move from South. I might have to some of your guys your would some of your guys like how many shoot shields did you win? Three? Two. 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 Would would any of your team know who Jai Ayub was? No. Oh Is man. Crazy? like yeah. Oh one. One guy maybe. Yeah, but that's cra- that's crazy to me. It's like you know, legend of the club. Tim Donnelly, guys like that. No. Yeah, Eastwood, Le- Eastwood legends. They should. I, I feel like the young guys should know about the story of the people that have played for the club. Yeah, man, I, you're not wrong. I, also, I, I, it's something that is being worked on the years. Just put some throwbacks up, man. Like put, like you know, before your team meeting is put a throwback to like 2015 or 2010. Right? Like a game, you know, where we played South or Randwick or something, you know, and show those guys. But um, I think it's. Also, like you'll know, maybe you haven't noticed, you guys got really strong juniors down there. We've gone from sort of when we won the comp, we were like 50% juniors. Fucking inc- insane to like 10 now. It's changed, like it's changed say, a lot lately. It's changed a lot, hasn't it? Like how many, like how many of your first grade really see are going to be juniors at the club? Depends what, you dis- d- depends what you count as a junior. Like someone asked me this the other day. Or someone goes, oh, how many locals will we have? And I said, well, would you consider me a local? They're like, yeah. And I go, well, I'm not from here. You know, I played Colts here. So if you count, if yeah. you count guys that played Colts at South, then went into grade. Yeah. I'd have to sit down and work it out. There, there yeah. are definitely, there are definitely some, but it's not a huge. It's not the vast majority. If that, if that makes any yeah, sense. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I, and I think, but I think that's where the comp's gone in terms of recruiting, I think it's gone naturally there. So like I said, like seven years ago, the premiership winning team was, we had was like, we probably had eight juniors, which is, 
you know, we just, a lot. we're probably playing on for the time. That's a lot yeah. now. But at the time, like if you went to West or you went to Randwick, that, well, not Randwick, but like, you know, Norths or whatever, they probably had eight juniors as well. Whereas now, like, you know, guys get frustrated one club, they go to another club and eventually they find home. But, you know, we'd probably, I'd say we'd have two or three juniors, you know. Yeah. So a lot more down the grades, a lot more down the grades, like, you know, fours predominantly juniors and local guys. But up the top, you, I think the nature of sort of recruitment, the comp's a little bit more, it's more malleable in terms of where players go. So I think it is far less, far less. I think, I think, and I've said this to you before, definitely, but I think what's going to have to happen is that the shoot shield's going to have to start paying people like equivalent to the English championship kind of wages. Because if you want super rugby to be as good as it can be, you really need your shoot shield, your Brisbane club competition to be as good as it can be. So now the, the shoot shield is being looked at very, very highly from people all over the world now. Obviously, because of the exposure with Stan, there's guys going to Japan, France, uh, USA, Ireland, Holland. There's people going everywhere. So if you want this, so if in Super Rugby, our top guys are good. They have a few injuries, and you're down to the Shoot Shield guys. And if all the Shoot Shield guys are playing rugby overseas, it's going to leave slim pickings yeah. for people to to pick up the spot. So I think, you know, the the salary caps a lovely idea. I know most teams are probably ignoring it. Um, I don't know why I winked then, but there's a, there's a lot of teams that are clearly <laughs> ignoring. There's a lot of teams that are clearly ignoring it. Why don't you just brush it and and start paying guys properly? Because as, mate, as you know, even as a coach, it's not a three night a week thing. It's a fucking big job. You know. Yeah, I always I always complain. I'm not complaining. I always say you got to be crazy to coach. I think you got to be a little bit crazy to play as well. Because like you said, should should regarded reasonably highly. So. Uh, for a while, while the NRC was on, a lot of those gigs overseas would be like NRC, show the NRC. That's gone to shit. So it's like, you know, True Shield is looked at reasonably well. Like not, we'll be not the so fucking much top in of the, the world. Forwards. Uh, probably everywhere but tight forwards, it's, it's looked out upon yeah. very well. Yeah. Um, but your high level tight forwards will, will, you know, they'll go on to do something if they're good. And like the, you know. what you said, right? So like before, you got to be a bit crazy to do it because particularly if you're aspirational because like, you know, if you're not like I, like I, Mike Weiser last year, he, I'm obviously close with him. He ended up playing for the Rebels. Mate, I was with him a week before that. He's, he's at uni and he like working a bar job. So like the discrepancy between full-time and next year is so large. Um, you know, like, so, imagine if you were getting 30 to 40 Ks. Well, just, just say you, you're a young guy, you got a job, which is rugby, you know, rugby um, centric, whatever. You, your boss lets you work around your rugby. You're getting 20 to 30 K a year to play shoot shield. You're going to be far more likely mm. to stay, aren't you? Or, or, or oh. to attract other good players. You well, know? you're going to get, yeah, mate, one, one million percent like a bit of help uh, with rent. Yeah, unless. Yeah, unless you've got a loophole in your, like, unless you're from a country of Asia, like, unless you've got a Lebanese passport, you've got an English passport, like, you're screwed at the moment. So, um, if, mate, if they were paying that, I'd probably still be playing, realistically. 100%. Like, you, like just think you about this. Work Jared, around like, that. You, you live at home, you still you get an extra 30 to 40K a year. They pay you rent. You, you're not going to go overseas for anything that isn't substantial. Or, no. or a life experience at this point. So you might go to the MLR or Japan, basically. Yeah. But like mm-hmm. the, you see it, at, i tell you what you see, you see it in the Mitre 10. You do. It's not common, but you see like a 38-year-old guy who's retired from Super Rugby or he, he he's sort of fallen out of Super Rugby and he's still playing for Hawks Bay because Hawks Bay, he gets a decent wedge and he can still play good quality football. But like, there's absolutely no doubt that retirement age is falling lower and lower. It would would be vastly reduced by like more more money. Like people have to start working. Like, like I could give countless examples, but like you know, like Sam Ward, he could play another five years, man. He's a fucking animal, but he's got a he's got a full time job. He's got a business. Like, yeah. but if you threw him, you know, thirty grand, you know, it's different. It's different flavor. I ask you a question, and I know you. I know you got a big going on, so you have to go soon. But no, I'm all right, the, t- I'm all right. the TV rights money, how does that work? Because yeah. I remember when remember when they started broadcasting more than a couple of games a week 
for Channel 7 or, or whatever when the East guys bought it and it was like club TV. I can't remember all the details of it. Um, but my understanding of it is that there's very few people that are actually getting money from that TV revenue and it certainly isn't the clubs. Is that yeah, an we accurate statement? Yeah, yeah no, 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 clubs. You know, no, if, if you at the time, right, when they were doing the stand deal and the the Fox Sports deal fell through, right, I think it was Raylene Castle at the helm, helm of the pirate ship. Um, she, we, the Shoot Shield was offered money to be telecast by itself um but we got lumped in with the rest of australian rugby so they were trying to do a deal at the time ended up doing with stan stan's great don't know whether we get any money from it but we actually had at the, the first year of seven we were paying to be on seven shoot shield was paying to be on it um and this i can't remember what it was from whether it was a streaming service or whatever but they were going to pay the shoot shield $250,000, $500,000 to telecast the shoot shield. So, uh, but then Raylene came in and lumped us in with the ARU and Super Rugby so that we were sort of sold as a package. Uh, yeah. So unfortunately, any revenue that was going to be a massive turnaround, by the way, from paying to be on TV to getting paid. Oh, you know, a lot, no, no I'd, doubt it's awesome. And yeah. the clubs can make money through sponsorship, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. But but what I'm saying is, like, Stan's obviously been very successful. Like, show me the money. No, no. You know well, I mean? that's, been the, uh, that's been the criticism of Australian rugby since the dawn of the the troubles, I call them. Uh, yeah. Like, is the top – it's all it's top downs, no grassroots, no funding to the clubs. So, the shoot unless shoot they get problems. The shoot start its own streaming service. You get a shitload of games. They can't. Tw- so, that's the thing. They can't. They, I think that was part of the Rayland Castle thing is because they, they were going to, they were selling their rights, Sydney Rugby or whatever the weird board is, they were selling the rights to the comp and it was deemed or as, you know, some lawyers in a back room somewhere were like, well, no, you can't sell the rights. Australian Rugby owns the rights. So you're in oh. with this crowd. And at the time it was a dwindling crowd, right, who Fox Sports didn't want to buy um, – and it went for not not that much. Okay, so it's an Australian rugby owned product, even though all the players. Okay, yeah, right. This is why I talk to you. Pretty smart, sure. Man. Well, who do hey, we cool. pay? Who do we pay Rego to? Uh, they are you, yeah, yeah. Pretty sure it's they are you. Jeez, that's like a lot you of think money. That, that's a lot of money, just Jesus, Oh, mate, I I. It is fucking scary. I was, oh, uh, it, it is. What? What is it at, man? What's it at? Well, South Bay, yeah, South Park, I think it's four hundred. But that's not the that's not the scary part. That's only a small portion of the money that they are required to pay to offset the cost. I think. Don't quote me on this. I'm not. Uh, probably shouldn't talk unless I'm being. You know, fuck it. I, I yep. think it costs about fifteen hundred bucks a person to register a player. How the what are the fucking expenses like where they can be carried over to? This is what I've been told before. No, it's no, stuff, no, no, stuff to do with insurances, all that, uh, the ARU requirements, all that sort of shit. I, I probably shouldn't talk unless I got all the details, but um, the, the money that they ask the players for registration is only to offset the, the, co- the cost that the clubs pay, and it's only a very small portion of it. No, no, no I, I don't disagree with that. I don't think we, that's speaking out of turn. I don't think it's speaking out of turn to say the registration fees are fucking insanely high, even when offset. So, like, we're probably doing the same thing as you. But yeah. guys fronting up, and good, remember, this is all the great. So the first grade guys, maybe take it out of the match payments from round one and two. The fucking fourth grade guys who are paying 400 bucks for a pair of shorts and to play on the weekend. You're kidding me. Yeah. So... It's they criminal. need to do something about that. It's do criminal. you guys have it? Do you guys do? Um, yeah. No, let's not go into that. But yeah, I agree. I think, and and if, imagine if you're uh, like for kids' sport, I think the registration costs are getting higher. So if you've got multiple kids playing, you know, summer sports, winter sports, some of them play more than a sport at a time, it all adds up very quickly. They need to do something about that. I haven't got a solution. Hey, it's all good. I, well, I don't know. I'd like I'd like to see where it goes personally, but interestingly, yeah. subbies don't pay many fees apparently. So I'd like to know how that all works. Subbies, I've been told subbies, subbies don't really pay much. Subbies are run by New South Wales, though, rather than 
ARU, I think. Okay. Maybe different governing, different governing body. But yeah, look, I think the 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 fucking summary is we. I think everyone's paying way too much registration, and I think that if Shoot Shield was an independent uh, product that was sold to people, you get a surprising amount of people willing to pay five bucks a week to watch their team play. I think I you'd actually get a fucking oh, you'd get heap, a lot. A yeah, heap. I agree. You would, um, mate. When you, get, you know South is on the come up again, but when remember when we were in the finals, kind of regularly, sort of. 2010, hmm. you know, that kind of era, they don't get messages from people yeah. in the state all over the world checking up on how we're going. And I'm sure when you guys were winning it all, uh, you would have got the exact same thing. So there's a huge undercurrent of support for, for club rugby. Um, mate, I, we've, we've definitely talked about this, but I think the national club comp thing's got to happen as well. I don't, I, I've thought about it a billion times. I don't know how it's done. Well, I, I think what if you had like okay. a two tiers or you had like a system where the top four teams went through every year? The, the, the difficulty in that is having arrangements for the top four before they are the top four. So like how yeah. do you arrange... So you'd have, to give, you'd have to give them like a mini preseason and then the funding, yeah, you're right, it wouldn't work. Yeah. It's, look, it's complicated. I, 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 I We played twice in that sort of national championship thing which no one watches but it was fun I think the concept's great but what will happen then Chubby as well if the top four teams from New South Wales go each year right all the talent in the comp is going to those top four teams all the talent so even more so than now where you know guys will go to like uni or they'll go to Eastwood because they like they think that that's where they they'll get looked at the most if you've been in that if you're likely to be in that so if you're a uni or a, like whatever is the normal top four, they are going to get flooded and completely empty the rest of the comp. So strong points. It's strong points. It's I complicated, guess ideally, man. Ideally, in an ideal world, it would be awesome. But um, I guess the reality of it, you're right. It'd be great. It'd be great if there was enough money. That the problem is not all teams would want to chip in, right? Because a lot of the teams would be like, well, "We're not going to be in the top four. I'm not putting fucking fifty grand in something we're not going to be in before yeah. it happens." But if there was enough money to subsidise a tournament where at the end of the year, the top three teams, top four teams from um, New South Wales played, the top four teams from Queensland, one from Canberra, one from Melbourne, um, one from WA. Yeah, that would be really good. And I think people would watch it because people actually care about their clubs. Um, but to have that happen, you'd also need not an exorbitant amount of money, but a fair bit amount of cash to run that, which I don't yeah. think anyone has. Tool you for us, save us. You for us. Mate, uh, this has been a good chat. Anything else to finish us off? Any thoughts? I don't think so. Any Rugby season's approaching. Uh, yeah, no, I will say, uh, I think the Tars, I think the Tars could be a problem for the Reds at this point in time. I just don't think the Reds are on. I think Brumbies versus Fiji should probably get postponed due to possible homicide. And Rebels versus the Force, I think the Force will do it. I think the Force are going to beat them. So I haven't looked at the odds on that one. Um, but I think I think I think they're the picks for me. No, I'm uh, picking a South Eastwood Grand Final this year. <laughs> I'd be happy to do that, mate. I'm going <laughs> South Eastwood Grand Final straight to Aspen Rugby Fest. So that would be great. Are you going? To, you going to Aspen? Yep. With a, with the team, or are you just going for a visit? With uh, Pacific Beach. Oh, that year old team from over in the. Um, oh man. Subsidised, heavily oh, subsidised. <laughs> how, how good are junkets? How good are junkets? The only I will say, Chubby, we uh, we we tried to get into the over thirty five division, <laughs> which I think I could pass as very easily. Um, but they actually changed it to forty and over now, so we unfortunately now have to play in the uh, in the opens. under forties comps, so the opens, and we have obviously the Ben, the head coach, uh, Johnny Grant, myself, Nick Batcher. Oh, good team, good team. Um, all the strange for Sydney Uni. So we're we're heading over from this side, meeting the American guys there. But I've a very bad feeling I'm going to have to tackle some former fucking All Black playing on twenty grand just to turn up or something. Mate, bad. It's, it's funny how seriously the American guys take it. We played in a sevens oh. tournament in Alaska, and um, with Deadwood, and it was amazing. Yeah. If you ever get to go, go to Alaska, mate. It's it's like how the world was before human beings fucked it. But um, this crazy Kiwi guy who, who owned an excavation company, 
ended up just over a period of years would just landfill on the side of his house and just build a rough I've seen field. it, man. I've seen uh, it. It's crazy. Incredible. Incre- and you're playing a game, it's like 11.30 at night. The sun's, the sun's out. And, yeah, <laughs> amazing. But we, uh, we played the U.S. Army Sevens team. And, um, oh, you know, oh, I, was play- I was – and we beat them in the rounds. And then they, they got some guys in for the finals. <laughs> And, um, you know, there's a video of them all kneeling over, like, stretching and praying and doing, like, all serious stuff. And we we didn't even warm up, just standing around having beers. And, oh, mate. You know. the Americans Americans are different gravy. You see what I'm saying? And I've st- I talk to my American friends every fucking day. But boy, when I first got to America, by the way, if you're out there somewhere, I wish I would put this up separately, and you want just an experience, go play rugby in Texas or California. Unbelievable. Um, but he, I got to training and Batch is like, look, I know you're not going to like this. We're going to have to do contact, heavy contact once. If you fucking whack some people and you run over some people, you never have to do it again. Um, Because that, and all they do is contact over there. So I got to my first session. I fucking hate contact. Anyone who knows me well, Chubby, you know me well, know that. I had to wail some like guys who probably never played the game before. Wild three or four of them, no contact for the rest of the season. But so what happened? They just wouldn't train with you or like, well, no, they'd be like, oh, okay, these guys can do it. You know, like these guys, oh, they know what they're doing. But like all Americans is just full contact all the time. So like a perfect session for them would be five meter, five meter drill down the train tracks, just fucking 20 on 20 all in brawl. Um, it's, they do so much. Con- it's, but so he basically was like, if you do a good job this one session, we can just sit out of contact the rest of the year. And that's what we did. That's fucking awesome. Fuck, I wish I could do that. I wish we could do that. Oh, I don't fucking play anymore. Um, mate, that was good. I'm looking forward to this weekend. It's all going to go around again. This season's 16 for me. Shoot, shoot. Crazy. Mm. You'd be, you be getting I'm, up there as well now. Yeah, 12. 12. 12. It's a growing mate, but it's uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, thanks to everyone who's been listening. Um, please like, subscribe, share. Video's been a bit shitty with this one, so we'll probably just put it out in audio. And um, any any closing remarks, thoughts? You know, no, 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 no. Predictions. But, but back the line. Back my pet. Back my tips, mate. They came through last week. They'll come through again. No worries, buddy. Well, let's uh, let's end it there. 